So you guys loved my $100 three node Proxmox cluster here. These Dell Wise 5060 thin clients. But each of them only has a 16 gig SSD built in and at the time they only had four gigs of RAM. So today we're gonna fix both of those problems, the low RAM and the storage cost. And we're gonna do that using 128 gig flash drives. And just for the clickbait, it's hyper converged. It's all the new rage now in enterprise. But we're really going to do it. We're going to hyper-converge these guys using Ceph, the cluster file system. So let's head off on this adventure and see what we can learn about Ceph. So it's true, I did pay $100 for these three thin clients. They were $35 each with a 10% discount for buying in bulk. But each of them only has a 16 gig SSD built in, and at the time they only had 4 gigs of RAM. So it wasn't super useful as a cluster. You could run maybe one virtual machine per node, and with 16 gigs of storage, you weren't gonna fit much at all once you install Proxmox itself. So for that video, I used shared storage on a NAS, and I didn't include that in my price. It's in the room behind us, and it costs about $1,000, hard drive prices these days. So today we're gonna fix both of those problems, the low RAM and the storage cost. These little suckers right here, 128 gigs for like 15 bucks. Not a bad deal, I mean, they're, they're pretty slow. They're USB, USB 3, but, uh, they're probably not reliable either, but eh. It hits our price target. And as you saw in another video, I upgraded the RAM on these guys to 12 gigs each. I spent $75 on the RAM upgrade and 45 on the SSDs. So we're gonna call this the $250 cluster. Now Ceph is a really big topic. Like it's really, really big. Literally, it scales out into petabytes. We're not gonna scale into petabytes today. Today we're limiting our focus on Proxmox's implementation of Ceph and using Proxmox on Ceph to store our virtual machine images for this three node Proxmox cluster using a three node Ceph cluster running on the same hardware. Of course, I did this for 250 bucks using this junk. You could do this with nicer hardware and follow the same steps as I did. So I got the three node cluster again. We're gonna cluster them as we did in the last video. So I'm gonna create the cluster Okay, so now these nodes are clustered. So now we can install Ceph. So I'm going to install Ceph on the first node here, and then we'll have to do that. So if we click on Ceph, it says Ceph is not installed on this node. Would you like to install it now? We're going to say yes. So because we don't have a Ceph cluster at all yet, this wizard is going to walk us through configuring the cluster on this Proxmox cluster. So we currently don't have anything installed, so we're going to choose Pacific, which is the latest version. Start that. So now it's going to install Ceph, then it's going to let us configure our cluster. And once we've configured it, it'll copy that configuration to everything else. So yes. Okay, now this is done, we're going to click Next. So now it's going to let us configure the network. So Ceph has two network interfaces it uses, what it calls the public network and the private network. So private network in Ceph is the network that Ceph uses to communicate with itself. So if Ceph has to rebalance data across the cluster, it uses the private network, cluster network. The public network is not necessarily public. It's the network that Ceph clients use to access the data in the Ceph system. So if you have a Proxmox cluster, Proxmox itself will be considered a client of Ceph. So Proxmox will go across the public network to access data on Ceph. When Ceph then gets a request for data to a certain OSD, and that requires replication, the OSD might go to other nodes via the cluster network for replication purposes. So in this case, we only have one network, so we're gonna set them both the same. And we have a couple options here, so we need to choose the monitor node. So in Ceph, there's two primary daemons that we deal with. There's the monitor and the OSD. So the monitor stores the global state of the cluster. It's called the cluster map. And the monitor is redundant, you can run as many copies as you want, but in general, you should run three copies. If you have a bigger cluster, you can run more, but you don't need more than three. Uh, Proxmox is gonna set it up for us on PVE1 by default. We'll add more later. So this should configure our initial cluster with one monitor and no drives. So now before I go and I add drives, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna install Ceph on all of the other nodes. So if I click Ceph on PVE2, I'll install Ceph. I'll click that off on PVE3 as well. Okay, so it says Ceph Pacific installed successfully. 
So when we click next, it says configuration already initialized because we already configured our Ceph cluster. Foxbox just imported that. So we're done. So now we need to install the monitor daemon on PVE2 and once PVE3 is done installing PVE3 as well. So we go here and click monitor. We're going to create a monitor on PVE2 and Proxmox will do that. Let's see. So PVE3 is done installing. So we can create a monitor on PVE3 as well. So now we have monitors created on all three nodes. The Ceph monitor is separate from Proxmox's cluster system. So once you cluster with Proxmox, the Ceph cluster is essentially running on the same hardware, but it's its own cluster with its own cluster management, its own synchronization. And the monitors are how Ceph deals with synchronization. And they will deal with themselves on their own. You don't have to worry about quorum or anything like that, as long as you have at least three monitors. The manager is a little bit different. The manager is essentially a statistics GUI and things like that for Ceph. So the manager is not critical. You can create more than one if you want, but you don't have to. So Ceph also has its own dashboard GUI, and if we like, we can install that. So I'm going to install that on PVE1. So apt install Ceph your dashboard. So now we have to enable the dashboard. So we call Ceph NGR module enable dashboard. We need to add a self-signed certificate. So Ceph has a tool to do that called Ceph dashboard. Create self-signed certificate. There we go. Okay, next Ceph wants us to create an account in their system. So Ceph dashboard user create, AC user create. Call them admin. Okay, it needs a file with the password. So we'll create a file temporarily. Password two week. Ah. There we go. It actually enforces password security, which is great for you guys, but not great for me trying to test this. So finally, now that we have enabled an admin and we've created a self signed certificate, we have to disable and re-enable the dashboard. Okay, so here is what Ceph's dashboard looks like. So we have a health warning because we have no OSDs, and we have no capacity, no objects, and no PGs, because we have no disks yet. So that concludes installing Ceph. Now we have to get our disk set up. So if you're familiar with ZFS, you probably know that there's a lot of different ways you can configure disks. In Ceph, some of that is not done at the disk level, and some of that is. The simplest form of the disk is a single disk OSD, which stands for Object Storage Daemon. So we're going to install one of those on PVE1. We're going to go into the shell on PVE1, and we're going to find out what drives we have. So if we look at our dev and look for data devices. So we have SDA, 1, 2, and 3, and SDB. And I happen to know SDB is right, but if you want to make sure, you can do ls-l get disk by ID. So now we see ATA 16 gig SATA flash drive. So that's the internal storage on the Dell 5060. And that goes to SDA. And then it has three partitions, which go to SDA 1, 2, 3. And then there's some other stuff on SDB, which is probably a previous install of something. But it's USB SAN disk 3.2 Gen 1. That's SDB. So now we're going to get rid of everything that was on that disk to make sure that it's completely wiped so we don't have any problems going forward. So Ceph volume LVM that dev SDB destroy. There we go, zapping successful. So now you want to zap all of the drives you're going to use on all of your systems. Okay, so we've zapped all the drives. Now we can go here, PDE1, and scroll down to Ceph, and click OSD, and we're going to create an OSD. So you're going to have to do this for every single drive in your cluster, individually. 
So first off, the disk. This is where the actual data is stored. In this case, the only free disk it found is dev sdb on PDE1. And it's 123.06 gigs. So that's the disk we're going to use. That's our 128 gig flash drive. Now, there are two other disks you could potentially use. The DB disk and the wall disk. So what is the DB and the wall? So if you're familiar with ZFS, ZFS has a, a special disk type called a slog. Um, and the slog is used for synchronous writes. It stores the ZFS intent log synchronously so that synchronous writes can complete with lower latency. It does not improve throughput of the ZFS pool. A similar thing is here in Ceph. So in Ceph, instead of the pool as a whole managing synchronous writes, each individual OSD is responsible for managing synchroni synchronization of its writes. So if you're using slow spinning rust here for your disk, and you care a lot about synchronous write performance, you could take a flash drive, even, even a small one, and allocate it as the wall disk. And that would help speed up synchronous writes. DB disk is kind of similar. So in Ceph, there's no central database of where something is stored. Instead, that is computed based on the pool information and a thing called the crush map, which the monitors store and, and distribute to all the clients. So the crush map contains a list of all of the OSDs in the system. So every single hard drive in the entire cluster is stored in the crush map. And from the crush map, the client can compute which drive in the system it should store its data on. It's called a placement group. But then the drive has to figure out where that data is on the actual disk. So each OSD has a database of where data is stored on the drive itself because the clients know they need to go to a specific drive in the system based on the crush map, but then the drive has to figure out what block to put it on on itself. So if you have systems that are mixed SSD and hard drive, you could either use the SSDs as separate OSDs entirely, or you could use them as DB and wall disks, and you're allowed to partition them and use a single SSD as a DB or wall or more than one hard drive if you want. The rule of thumb is that the DB disk is between 2 and 4% of the size of the data disk. If your data disk was, say, 10 terabytes, you would want to have around 400 gigabytes available for the DB disk, depending on your use cases. And if you're using RBD or CFFS, those change the amount of metadata a little bit. The wall disk does not have to be very big. It's going to be very tiny, several gigabytes. So in this case, I'm going to use the OS, OSD disk because I don't have anything that's faster to store the DB or the wall on. And next is the device class. So here, this is just a keyword that's added to the crush map. So you can say it's an HDD, SSD, or NVMe. And if you configure your own Ceph cluster, you can add your own items here too, but usually you just pick one of these. And later on, we have the option of saying that a certain pool should always be stored on a certain device class. And that can be used to speed up access to certain types of data without having to, to create more than one Ceph cluster. So if you have high speed, you could use SSD or NVMe for your VM disks, while you use SSDs or HDDs for your large bulk file storage or something like that. In this case, because it's a USB drive, I'm gonna say it's an HDD. Again, there's a warning here. Um, don't use hardware RAID, pass every single disk through to the host and create a separate OSD for each one. Unless you're using the like a, an SSD as a DV or wall disk, Every single disk should have its own OSD. So we create that. Now we have one OSD. It's named OSD0. It's an HDD. It is up and it is in. And we still don't have enough OSDs to make a full cluster. So let's go to the other nodes and do the same thing. Now we have all three OSDs. By default, Ceph will name it OSD.anumber, and it will always choose the lowest available number. So if you're going to replace a drive, you delete the existing one that leaves a hole where the number used to be, and you add the new drive back in, and it'll claim the number from the previous drive. That messes up the crush map the, the least amount. So you'll note here this is a bit of a tree. So we have PVE3 has OSD2, PV2 has OSD1, PV1 has OSD0. Ceph has a concept of redundancy groups, and by default the hierarchy is to have an OSD as the lowest level of redundancy, and above that is the host. And they don't have anything above that, but if you like, you can configure your own things. So you could have, say, a group for each rack, a group for each aisle, a group for each data center, and that builds a hierarchy of which data center, aisle, and rack each OSD is in. Then you can say, 
where you want the data to be distributed across the failure domains. So by default, Ceph is going to be configured to have two failure domains as the OSD level and the node level. And they're going to want replication across the node level. That means we can deal with the failure of any node and this cluster will still be fine. So if you have a whole bunch of storage on one node and not a lot on the other nodes, it might have a hard time allocating placement groups because it can't fulfill the rules that it must keep data on separate nodes. And so you have the option of changing that, but I'm not going to do that today. So now if we come back here, we see we have three OSDs, one placement group, group everything is happy. We have 343.8 gigs total in the system, which is great, and we're not doing any, anything special. Proxmox has their own GUI here as well. If you view Ceph, so we see three OSDs in and up. All the PGs are active and clean. Two managers, no metadata servers. Metadata servers are only used for CephFS. And today we're only going to do uh, Rados block device. There we go. So we have added three OSDs now. That is the minimum for a cluster. Now we can learn about pools. Oh, pools. By default, we have a pool that Ceph uses to store its own health metrics. Um, that's not very useful to us. So what is a pool? So if you're familiar with ZFS or ZFS, you know that you can arrange data in a hierarchy of data sets. And those data sets usually contain data like a file system. And Ceph is kind of similar in that you have pools and pools contain data. But each pool can have a different rule of how the data should be stored. So unlike in ZFS, it's possible to create a pool of data that has triple redundancy so all the data is triplicated across the cluster and also create a pool with no redundancy or with erasure coding, which is similar to RAID. So the first pool we're going to create is going to be a store of VM images. And we're going to use replication for this, which means the data is stored multiple times across the cluster. So we're going to go here and click create. So the name is going to be called, what do we want to call it? So Ceph replicate. This is going to become the name of the storage in Proxmox as well. So a size of three. That tells us to replicate all of the data three times. And min size of two, that tells us that we're allowed to operate on the data as long as at least two of the copies are valid. So if we have a three node cluster with a size of three, that means all of the data will be copied to all of the nodes. If one of the nodes drops out, we still have two nodes and the cluster is still happy. If a second node drops out, we're down to one, then the pool becomes read only and doesn't allow access anymore. This is usually a good setup for virtual machine images a size of three and a min size of two. And if you're going to use replicated pools, I recommend you stick with these numbers. If you need a lot of data security, you can up the, the size number, but remember, it's going to try to replicate this across different hosts. So if you have a lot of drives in a small number of hosts, you might have to change the Ceph backend to allow it to store uh, data on multiple OSDs instead of multiple hosts. So we're gonna click create, and it's gonna add it as a storage to Proxmox. So now we should be able to install a virtual machine on the Ceph replicate pool. And for simplicity, I'm going to add a Samba store where I keep ISOs. So I added my NAS. There are ISO images here, a whole bunch of them. So we're going to create a virtual machine and install it and see what happens to Ceph as we do that. So here we get to choose our Ceph pool. We're going to use the replicated pool. We'll give it 32 gigs of disk space. SSD emulation and discard, our favorite flags. I don't know, two cores. Two cores seems fine. Okay, so I have Ubuntu Jammy Jellyfish installing itself. So now we can look at what happens on the Ceph side. So we got 65 placement groups now. We have a tiny amount of I.O. going on, a very small amount. So writing some megabytes per second, not a lot. One of the downsides of Ceph is that it's not necessarily designed to be as fast as something like ZFS. It's designed to scale to a much broader level. So ZFS is a scale up file system. You build a bigger and bigger and bigger server that has a ton of resources and handles a ton of data very quickly. With Ceph, you scale out, you add more servers, and by adding more servers, you increase the throughput of the system. But a lot of data is still going over the network connection, and the fact that I have one gig ethernet here is really gonna limit things. If we look here on the health page, we notice that um, the process happened so slowly, we actually got into a health warning scenario. So basically what happened was our drives were so slow, or our network was so slow, that it wasn't able to replicate things as fast as the VM was writing data. 
So it's trying to keep three copies of everything, but sometimes it gets into a state where it only has two. And it allows the I.O. to complete as long as there's at least two copies that are finished. And if the third copy takes a long time, then it says it's degraded and has to recover it. So what could potentially happen is if one of your hard drives is very slow or it fails, you'll get into a state where it'll say degraded, but the data is still fine and active. It just doesn't have as many copies as the rules say it should. But as long as it's above the min size, it'll still let the VMs operate. So just to demonstrate that, I'm going to intentionally take one of the OSDs out. I'm going to choose PVE2's OSD. So I'm going to say Ceph OSD out OSD.1 because OSD.1 is on PVE2. And this is going to simulate the OSD failing. So now we get a health warning here. It says one PG inactive. So we have two that are up and in and one that is up and out. So out means it is not part of the cluster. Now the cluster is going to try to figure out how it can recover. And because it lost this one drive, what it's going to want to do is move all of the data to other drives. But because we only have three drives and it wants three, live, three levels of redundancy, it's going to be in a persistent state where it doesn't have enough OSDs to replicate. But nonetheless, the VM continues operating. So bring that drive back in. So now we brought the OSD back in. Now it's back in. Now it has to rebalance all the data that got stored while the OSD was gone. So if you have a three node cluster and you temporarily lose a node, the cluster is going to keep running. But as soon as that node comes back up, you're going to do a ton of IO across the cluster to rebalance all the data. So all the data still has the same level of redundancy that it should. And all the data that shouldn't have been stored on that server while that server was down has to get rebalanced. In this case, we didn't lose a ton of data. We didn't lose any data, but we didn't miss the replication of a lot of data because it was only out for a few seconds. So we've just scratched the surface of what Ceph can do. Like I said earlier, Ceph is big. Ceph is really, really, really big for big, big data. But that doesn't mean we can't use it in the home lab. We get some advantages. We get high availability of the file system. We get to configure redundancy on a per pool level, which is something I didn't do in this episode, but I'm sure I'll touch on it later. We get nice integration in Proxmox. I'm sure there's many other advantages too. Ceph is a wonderful file system. And between Ceph and ZFS, you can pretty much cover all of your storage needs. So what's next for this cluster? Well, today I was only able to fit in a really basic replicated storage pool. I'd like to go into more details on erasure coding and the different ways you can configure Ceph just for block devices. And I'd also like to get into CephFS, the file system. But I did not have time for that today. Ceph is a big, big thing, and it takes a lot of time to explain. So hopefully you'll like and subscribe and stay with me so we can do more of this project in the future. Thanks for watching. Bye!